Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to be with you all this morning um, as we come together to worship God in this place in space, whether you're present in the sanctuary or worshiping online. We are pleased that you're here with us today. A couple of announcements on the way in. If you noticed the space on the way in, uh, the, we've taken out three pews, and that is destined to be a family ministry area, and apparently it already is, because <laughs> the family is back there playing a little bit more room to roam. So yeah, that's like, that is exciting, but just a way for families with young kids to be able to come and be in worship along with us. We're so blessed to have one of those in our presence and then grandkids and other kids who come in from time to time. So that's what that's about, my friends. Um, next Sunday, we will be um, asking you to come and stay for a while. We'll have worship at 1030, then we'll have an all-church potluck following. So the ovens will be on where you can keep things warm. I suspect potluck will... <laughs> I've never had one here with you, so I don't even say, I know all the details of how that happened. Bring a dish to pass. If you guys bring your own table service, do. If you don't, don't. Um, but we will make it work. And then we're going to have a town hall. I'm hoping just in the uh, social hall space so we don't have to move back and forth. But just to talk a bit about where we are as a congregation a couple years in, to my time as a pastor here, where we are as a denomination, what's happening with that, and to do just some celebrating uh, of some great things that have happened. So I invite you to come together for that, and just a reminder, Trunk or Treat is coming down the road. So October 31st, if you want to come and uh, decorate your car and hand out candy, that's great. If you want to just donate candy for those who are doing so, we appreciate it. I looked at Mark the other day and went, we might have trick-or-treaters at our house this year <laughs> at the parsonage, so I think he'll be home doing that. That's a new thing for us. Um, with all that being said, we come today kind of where and how we are to worship the God who loves us and who delights in receiving our attention, our prayer, and our praise. Good morning. Diane Garfield, the liturgist today, and I'd like to welcome you on this beautiful, sunshiny morning. Please join me for the call to worship. We have gathered in this place to worship because Jesus invites us to come. We come as we are with our faith and our doubts, with our successes and our failures, because Jesus invites us to come. We come with what we have, bringing with us the events and experiences of this past week, because Jesus invites us to come. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Let us worship God together. Please join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for all the blessings that you give us. We thank you, Lord, for always being there, for whenever we need you. Your special touch just means so much to us. And all we need is maybe a butterfly flying past or a bird or the little scamper of, of a little ground squirrel. And we know your presence is there and your goodness is there. Lord, we pray that you be with this service. Bless us all, and we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, I'm Jim Algridge, and I'm your song leader this morning. Um, this morning, as you can see, we're going to sing What a Beautiful Name, and many of you have sung this before or heard it before. And it's just a wonderful song that juxtapose Jesus' majesty, thinking of him with God the Father in heaven, and then the same Jesus came to earth and humbled himself and died on a cross for us and was risen from the dead, and yet 
his power remained intact through all of that. So let's sing of Jesus' glory today with a, what a beautiful name. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival. You have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a beautiful name it is, what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is the name of Jesus. Amen. It's in that name that we come together that we worship, and it is in that name that we give as we come to a time of offering. Invite the usher to come forward and receive that. Um, it's always a conversation between you and God as you give, as the Holy Spirit leads you to give, to support the mission and ministry of this body of Christ in this place. May you give today as the Holy Spirit leads you to give, and may it be a time of blessing.
Will you please stand as you are comfortable today and sing our prayer and our praise in the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ whose power uplifts. Praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Loving God, on this beautiful fall morning, we return these gifts to you. We are given so many gifts, and we see them all around us at this time of year in beauty and harvest and in abundance. May you use these gifts to produce that harvest in and through us. We give you this in the name of Christ. Amen. Please join me with the affirmation of faith. We believe in God, maker of all things, provider of all things, who loves all people. We follow Jesus in whom salvation has come to us. He sees us for who we are, heals the wounds of our hearts, and makes us new. In his death and resurrection, we see the deepest truth of life. We live by the power of the Holy Spirit, which empowers us for the self-giving love. We give thanks for the church, the body of Christ, and for the gift of forgiveness, the power of resurrection, and the mystery of eternal life. Amen. All right, Brian, if you and Elijah want to come up, I'm going to do a little children's time this morning. So we've been talking about games. This is our second of a four-part series on the games people play. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so we'll come this way so you can. So do you, did you guys grow up in game playing families? You did, all right. Uh, all right. More children in your family, less, right? Only child, right? Yeah, yeah. It's hard to play a table game by yourself as an only child, for sure. So do you plan on raising Elijah to play games? All right, very cool. And I should have given you the mic, sorry. Um, so, you know, right now there's three of you to play a game. How many people do you want? Another one on the way for the crackles. <laughs> Woo! Due in May. Yeah. So, I'm very excited. We're all very excited for you. We are glad. <laughs> that was very nice timing for the, the Sunday. We're kind of preparing for the family ministry area. So, I told them our, our work is to make sure there's space for them. Their work is to produce the family. So... <laughs> <laughs> we, we might think we have the easier job here, friends. But <laughs> um, so we come to a time of prayer. I'm just going to start with a time of blessing for, for you folks. So let's just be in prayer together. Loving God, we thank you so much for the gift of Brian and Ashley and Elijah in our midst. We ask you to bless this pregnancy and Ashley's strength, her perseverance. We know it was hard last time without a, a baby, so may this go well for her and for them. May you just um, continue to knit them together as you're knitting this baby together in Ashley's womb, creating the family that they desire to be and that you desire them to be. 
We are so grateful that they are here, and we are so grateful that you will bless them on this beautiful day. We just think of all families, uh, families who are joyful with great news on this day and whole and healthy and sound, and families who are struggling, who have kids who are barely making it through a school week, uh, with parents who are barely putting food on the table, with all the varieties of life that are present in young and growing and living families. May we be people that help provide what is needed, who stand in the gap, who just offer unconditional love and acceptance for the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and just the people that God places in our lives. There's really no greater blessing to us than to do that and to be a source of blessing for others. So may you give us what we need to do that. Hear our voices as we pray together the prayer spoken by your Son. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. Our next hymn is hymn number 408, The Gift of Love. And this is a song that will be a part of our service during the time of the Games People Play series. So you'll get very familiar with it. But it is a good reminder of in all that we do that we keep Christ's love in the midst of, of all of that. Because if, if we, even if we do the very best that we can, um, if we do not have love in the midst of it, we're not effective as God's people and followers of Jesus Christ. So shall we sing the gift of love? Though I may speak with bravest fire and have the gift to all inspire, and have not love, my words are vain as sounding brass and hopeless gain. Though I may give all I possess, and striving so, my love profess. But not be given, my love within, the prophet soon turns strangely thin. Come, Spirit, come, our hearts control, our spirits long to be made whole. Let inward love guide every deed. By this we worship and are freed. The scripture lesson today is taken from Matthew 11, 25 through 30. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and shown them to babies. Indeed, Father, this brings you happiness. My Father has handed all things over to me. No one knows the Son except the Father, and nobody knows the Father except the Son, 
in anyone to whom the Son wants to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are struggling, hard and carrying, <clears throat> excuse me, carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Put on my yoke and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble, and you will find rest for yourselves. My yoke is easy to bear, and my burden is light. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Scared them into the front pew here. <laughs> we are in the second week of this four week message series called The Games Ple People Play, exploring games as a metaphor for our life in Christ. Last week I spoke about how I was raised in a game playing family, playing board games and card games and table games with my siblings and my parents, one of our major sources of entertainment. As you might expect, I also raised a game playing family. We, with my kids, we played many of the same games but added more, shoots and ladders, Candyland and Guess Who, later things like Pictionary and Trivial Pursuit and taboo. Now as young adults they introduce us to new games. So in recent years we've played Ticket to Ride and Settlers of Catan at family gatherings. A few years ago for my birthday they gave me the gift of doing an escape room with me. Kind of a big three-dimensional <laughs> surrounding game which was a, just a ball. So this game geek today gets to intersect with this game of Jenga. Who's familiar with Jenga? All right. It's one of those games we had in our house as my children grew, and it's very simply a game of balance. It was invented by a woman named Leslie Scott in the 1970s. She grew up in Africa. And with her siblings, she created this game out of scraps from a nearby sawmill. And Jenga is the Swahili world word for build. Things we never knew, right? And this is a regular size Jenga game. 18 layers of three blocks in alternating directions. 54 blocks total. And the rules are simple. Each player moves one block at a time. You have to kind of figure out which ones will move and places it on top. And you keep going until either it falls down <laughs> or the last person adds the last block to the top with the tower remaining stable for apparently 10 seconds. I don't know as we ever use that rule in my house. The last person standing is the winner. Perhaps as is true about the rules of all the games so far, that's maybe not how our life is meant to work, that the last person standing is the winner. So I'm going to take down this little Jenga. Because while it's fun, it's not fun enough for today. <laughs> That's all right. There is big Jenga and giant Jenga in the world. Lawn games, essentially, with Jenga. And this big Jenga, which makes a five-foot tower, if all the pieces are there, belongs to the Chapel Hill Youth Group, and I've borrowed it. So today we're going to view our lives through the metaphor of Jenga and see what we can build thinking about this metaphor of balance, thinking about the scripture, about Jesus' yoke resting lightly and easily on us. So we'll place the blocks together and think about what we might be building in our lives. So this is the size Jenga block we're playing with today. So for building a, a 
blocks, a tower of our life, we start at the beginning with our family of origin, the family into which we're born, with the circumstances of our birth, our place, country, time, economics, all of those things that we have absolutely no control over. And then there's our childhood health and well-being. Again, we, we new kids and no kids who are born with lots of challenges physically and mentally and emotionally and family systems and circumstances also produce those. So that's another block. And then our life begins outside a family with elementary school and middle school and high school. All those years spent mostly in the company of other kids. And then certainly through all through the school years, there's friends and interests, what sparks our curiosity, what kind of sports or groups are we in through our school year, what things do we start moving toward in our lives. There are those early romantic relationships, whether they're the second grade crush or the high school boyfriend. For many of us at some point, and you know, everybody's tower is gonna look different, right? With blocks put in different ways and places. But there's a first car we might get in high school, we might not get till later. There's college or trade school or our first job, whatever that looks like after we kind of leave the nest of high school. For some folks, that's military service. And then there's more friends, certainly. They're just blocks and layers that build and build as we go through life and exploring adulthood. What does that mean? What does that look like for us? If we think of ourselves, if we think of our families, it looks like such different things for 20-something-year-olds, doesn't it? And we all walk through that. There's perhaps a partner and a spouse, maybe one who sticks, maybe there's another block added in along the way. And there's where we choose to live. You know, not that many kids grow up and go to college and stay in the community they were born in anymore. Jobs may take them elsewhere. They may just decide they're a Pacific Northwest kind of person or family and leave. There's a first apartment, maybe a first house. And then there's the stuff we put in our first apartment or first house that has often been called early attic, right? <laughs> it's the stuff everyone gives us so we don't have to buy things. And that certainly flows, flows out of our lives as well. And then there's the stuff we can buy when we can afford it. I can still remember buying my first couch at what was then Herp's downtown <laughs> in Battle Creek, probably in my 20s, and how exciting that was to buy a piece of furniture that I actually chose. And there's maybe a better car. And then there's children. That might be a block or two <laughs> or one and a one and a third maybe. Is that where we are right now? <laughs> and then there's the requisite minivan or maybe baby SUV these days that comes with children. Whatever early car we had that barely ran down the road and too, was too small isn't going to do for our family life. So there's a new car. And pets come into our lives. And then there's the stuff we just begin to accumulate. And as someone who just moved, I, I can talk about that one all day. <laughs> we can accumulate a lot of stuff in our lives as we know it. And then there's the stuff that goes with raising kids. Do I hear a hallelujah back there? <laughs> it's amazing how much stuff these little people that come into our lives need. 
And then there's that collection of bunny teapots that we have because once we thought a bunny teapot was cute and now everybody thinks we're collecting them and all of a sudden we have 54 of them and really just wanted the first one. Perhaps in our tower there is a church home, a place of faith and family that we go to surround us and be with us on our journey. And there might be the boat or a motor home and all the yarn or the fabric or the power tools, <laughs> whatever it is that meets our interests, the things that we, none of our hobbies seem to take one thing, <laughs> do they? They all take piles and bins and a workshop of things. And there's the friends we make along the way, a lifelong journey of gathering people into our circle, sometimes saying goodbye to friends due to loss or circumstance or just season. There's vacations and experiences. And some people want lots of blocks with that, some people just a few. And there's perhaps purpose and meaning that we find in our life. The why are we here and what do we do? And sometimes it takes a while as we build our tower to begin to ask that question. There's hobbies and interests and volunteering, things we do when we have a little more time, maybe when the kids have left the nest. And there's retirement with whatever that brings and grandchildren. <laughs> and great-grandchildren, and legacy. And maybe some pondering of what comes next as our life nears an end and our tower is nearing completion. And over time, we've made a pretty impressive tower, or at least the best tower we can with the blocks we have, right? These are the blocks I have. We might compare the height of our towers with other people's towers and feel proud of them or not as proud of them and wonder why we don't have as many blocks as the next person. But even our tower is a little bit on the wobbly side, a little bit more tippy than we might wish. And along the way life happens. The game is underway and blocks start being removed from our carefully constructed tower. And some of those blocks are things we choose, but a lot of them are just things that happen in our lives. And every block removed has us trying to add another block to recover. And now we feel a little less sure of our building process. So down here, in our childhood, there might have been some childhood trauma, whether it's parents going through a divorce or a lot of the cruel things that happen to children. And so we start adding some coping mechanisms to our lives. And in school, we might have been bullied and we learn to be tough. And along with those early relationships, there's breakups and heartaches and lessons we learn and lessons we don't learn. And perhaps we make a knee-jerk choice in response to some of that. And there is almost inevitably some unwise choices of youth. I once traveled alongside a young man who had a DUI at 18, and that unwise choice to set his life on such a different trajectory for a time that was a two or three year recovery period while he dealt with the consequences of that. And some of those consequences we can recover from and some we can't. And there's often addiction. You're just waiting, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. 
too often, there's addiction. And that can, as we watch young people in our life, that can take a year, it can take two years, it can take a decade, 20 years out of the lives of people. And that just stresses our tower, it stresses our tower as a family, watching our young people go through this. And there's always a new kind of starting over that comes with that. And 50% of the time in America, there's a divorce. Those early relationships, our spouses are not the ones that we are with for a lifetime. So there's a second marriage and a blended family. We can see we're getting a little tippy here. There's failure and big mistakes. Those don't just come in addiction as youth, those come along the way. It might be unwise investment, it might be adultery, it can be just all kinds of life-altering big mistakes that we make in life. And there are big consequences often for those big mistakes that make everything a bit wobbly. And there can be severe illness that really throws us off. As someone who went through cancer in my 40s, I know it altered the course of my tower. It altered how I see the world. And there can certainly be the death of a loved one and grief and what we learn about grief. And for some people that happens early in their lives and for some people that happens later, but it always happens, doesn't it? And it reshapes the way that we see the world and the way that we build our tower. And the world keeps going, and there are things like 9-11, and January 6th, and natural disasters and hurricanes that make us feel a little less safe and a little less certain less sure about how we are in the world. There's stress and fear and anxiety, and family conflict and estrangement and another loss and another betrayal and it just doesn't take much. <laughs> gone. Oh no. Have you ever felt like your tower of life has taken a big fat crash? We're all awake now, aren't we? <laughs> big fat crash. There's a poem I found when I was writing this by Ashley Aguilar. I'll give you a clue. Not, nope, not quite yet. Yeah. It's all right. I wonder when Jenga became a metaphor for my life. Piece by piece, I am being stripped away just so I can keep playing this game. One by one, they are taken, leaving me off balance and unfocused. I wonder how long I can keep going before I fall. My own life journey, which I've told a few times in this space, certainly had some periods where it just felt like the blocks kept being pulled out until my tower collapsed in a heap, and I collapsed with it. But we pick up our pieces and we start again. And sometimes we're blessed with friends who help us gather all the pieces and put them in one place, and Diane and Jim are gonna do that for me a bit this morning. Before we start over, let's spend some time thinking of how we might do this differently. In our scripture passage from Matthew for this morning, Jesus says these words, Are you tired, worn out, burnt out of religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me, watch how I do it, 
learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Thank you, friends, for picking up my blocks. <laughs> and you might be more familiar with the NIV passage that sounds like this. Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy business. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and I will give you rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. In the earlier part of this chapter of Matthew, Jesus is preaching to crowds in the Capernaum area of Galilee. He has poured out time, attention, and miracles on these folks, and they are still not getting it. They're still just getting caught up in the rules and the boundaries of faith that they know in the yoke, the given teaching of God, of Torah, and in some of the stricter Judaic law they have experienced. They're not connecting the dots between Scripture, John the Baptist, and Jesus, and they're just not getting his consistent message of love and grace, and he's honestly a bit fed up. Most of this chapter could be called, Jesus has had it. He smacks them upside the head a bit. He offers them some grace. He connects the dots more explicitly, prays for them, and then offers that gentle, life-giving words. Watch with me and work, work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. This passage has a long life in the Christian tradition as an invitation to all of those who are put off by the pretension of human religion, who have been bound up in the shoulds and oughts, who don't need more rules in their life, but who hear the inherent joy that is in there of living freely and lightly. Who doesn't want to live more freely and lightly and in relationship with Jesus? He's inviting everyone to be a disciple, to take on his yoke, the teachings of God as he has offered them. So think a bit this week of what you think the yoke of Jesus is, what you think the unforced rhythms of grace look like. You can find many of them in the Hebraic tradition. We find rich examples of those unforced rhythms as we watch and listen to Jesus throughout the Gospels. And those rhythms have come to be called spiritual practices, ways that help us walk in the world in the ways that Christ taught us. How might they help us build or rebuild our tower in a way that helps us find more balance and create some strength no matter what comes? We don't always get to rebuild our tower from the beginning. In fact, I would say we seldom do. But today, we'll, we'll start at the beginning as we rebuild it and consider how those spiritual practices might affect a bit what that looks like. This time, We'll start in the same place, but we're going to add some stickier blocks. You just have a little bit of masking tape, actually just rough side, but not sticky side out. It has the green on them, so you can watch them as we rebuild the tower. And those are representing that yoke of Jesus, the spiritual practices he demonstrated on earth. And so we'll kind of look at the tower and then start adding... So we start where we did, with family of origin and our circumstances of birth. It's our childhood health and well-being. But what if this time we added a block called faith? For those parents who have brought children this morning, that's Ashley and Brian. This is a keystone block you are placing in their life. For many who grew up in the church or raised their children in the church, this is true. But when you're a parent or a grandparent, a neighbor, an aunt, or a cousin who does something as simple as saying a table grace for a meal, 
offering a blessing for a transition in life or demonstrating compassion where judgment might come from others, you're putting that block in place. Luke 2:52, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. And there's elementary school and middle school and high school. But what if during that time you encountered the word of God in a way that you could read it and explore it and accept it? Bible stories, an old book that doesn't always make sense. We know that. But, you know, I heard that story about Moses and how he was not perfect and God used him. And I heard that story about Jesus hanging out with the people no one else wanted to hang out. And maybe I should do that. The word of God creating some sticky places in our lives. And then there's still friends and interest in those sparks of curiosity and early romantic relationships. In college and work and military. But again, what if along the way as things started getting a little harder and a little more complicated as they do, we encountered the idea of prayer, deep prayer. We learned to go to God in prayer and knew that no matter the who, no matter the what, the friends, the lovers who stayed or went, that you could ask all things and do all things through Christ. What if you knew that Christ and not another person was your center? Our lives get busier and busier with first car and more friends and college. That first apartment and the stuff we put in it and our first house. But what if kind of early we learn this idea of gratitude, of being thankful for what we have, of not just opting right in to our culture that says more and bigger and shinier and newer is better, but just being grateful for what it is we have. And that is in the middle of our tower. And there's stuff in our first place that everyone gives us, stuff we buy, we can afford it. And a better car and children and viewing children as a gift from God. Jesus called the children to him, and for a while in our lives, if we are parents, we are stewards of that gift in our own lives, as we are stewards of that gift in this congregation. <laughs> Love listening to that voice. <laughs> There's a minivan that comes with children and the pets. But perhaps we introduce into our own lives, into our family lives, the idea of Sabbath. We're not going to do travel teams that require us to be gone on a Sunday. We're going to watch church at home and have meal as a family and take a walk. Just a Sabbath time to slow down from busy lives. There's the stuff we accumulate and all the stuff that goes with raising kids. But there's spiritual practice of simplicity. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, but store them, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And maybe there's the motor home, but not the boat. I mean, not all the fabric and all the yard and all the power tools because we're walking with Jesus and our tower is going to look a bit different. There's the friends we make along the way and experiences, but maybe some of the experiences now look like mission trips or time spent 
serving others. And the purpose and meaning that we seek, rather than coming through our work and our people and our stuff, comes in a life filled in a deep and rich relationship with God. <laughs> weird, weird noise. <laughs> love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. What a keystone block that is for our lives. There's still hobbies and interests and volunteering and retirement and grandchildren and legacy. What do we notice about our tower? Still a little wobbly, but maybe a bit more stable. And blocks will still come out and life will happen even with Christ at the center. We haven't been promised a smooth life in an amazing tower free of block removal and crashes. John 16:33 tells us Jesus has not come to free us from the troubles of the world but to overcome them. Now we're so sticky we can't come out. So there still might be childhood trauma or bullying, but now rather than coping mechanisms, we're adding in the healing power of Christ. I have two grandkids for whom trauma defines an awful lot of who they are and how they behave and how they see the world right now. And part of my work as a grandparent is to pray for them every day for that healing power of Christ to come in their lives. And that's something that we can do for our children, for the children in our community and those around us. And maybe even though there's illness, there's hope and there's trust in God as we encounter it and in all the parts of life where there's exhaustion and stress and anxiety we know that we can stop and rest in that light in that freedom in that ease that Jesus has promised friends how stable is your tower what, when, where, what helps you create those sticky blocks that hold it together or replace what is lost? We can see the blocks of grace in this, the blocks of spiritual practice, faith, the word of God, prayer, gratitude, simplicity, Sabbath, mission and service, purpose and meaning. In the week ahead, I invite you to write down the blocks that have made your tower and the blocks that have been removed. Just think about your life a bit with this lens. Consider the sticky blocks that are there and the ones you might want to add. In the year ahead, I invite you to consider a new thing as you see spiritual practice experiences that are offered in the life of our church, that are at Trinity, that are at Chapel Hill. This is kind of my jam. <laughs> is spiritual practice and spiritual practice experiences, but I can't do them all here. But you will know when they're happening. And all of them just add some more of those blocks, and they're ones we can offer to our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. They make a difference. They help hold us together, hold our tower and our lives together, no matter what. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, in this moment, we hold the invitation to follow you. You love us enough to invite us all. You believe in us even when we don't believe in you. Help us to follow well. Take up your yoke of love and grace to practice the rhythms that you showed us, to live in your light, in your freedom, in every day. In your precious name, we pray. Amen. Our final song, I think, is in keeping with the message that we've heard today, especially with regard to what role we can play in um, 
being a conduit where Jesus can add some of those sticky blocks to people's lives and help stabilize them a little more. So think about that through the, through the week and be who you are as a child of God that you might add that stability here and there and uh, make their burdens a little lighter. This uh, next song is Pass It On, hymn number 572, if you're using your hymnal. It only takes a spark to get a fire going, and soon all those around can warm up in its glowing. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you spread his love to everyone. You want to pass it on. What a wondrous time is spring when all the trees are budding. The birds begin to sing, the flowers start their blooming. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you want to sing. It's fresh like spring, you want to pass it on. I wish for you, my friend, this happiness that I found. You can depend on him. It matters not where you're bound. I'll shout it from the mountain top. I want my world to know the Lord of love has come to me. I want to pass it on. Oh, that takes me back. Yes. <laughs> Beautifully. Friends, as we go from this place, just, just remember, just live in that yoke that is free and light is meant to be that is meant to help remove some of those blocks of stress and too muchness and too fastness and too hurriedness in our lives and may you carry that message to others that are around you that are part of your family as we go may we indeed pass it on we have the good news may we share it in every day Go in grace and peace, my friends. Amen. Amen.